This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and so much has happened this week, I can barely keep up with it all. Loads of Starship construction and updates. The speed of that development right now just blows my mind, and by the sounds of it, super heavy construction is coming sooner than we may have thought. Another awesome Starlink mission launched early in the week. That was the fifth batch of Starlink satellites there with some new surprise changes to the launch profile. More updates to Crew Dragon's testing progress, and a surprise announcement of tourist missions being organized in the future with Crew Dragon. And to top all of that off, an Antares launch with a commercial resupply mission delivering more cargo to the space station with Cygnus. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Over to Starship Development and another remarkable week for the team in Texas at Boca Chica's facility. On Monday, the upper tank component of the Starship, which is this component here, made up of these five rings and the bulkhead on top, was stacked on top of the central segment, which makes up part of the lower tank. The other half of this section is still separated with the very bottom section of the Starship here. This is a complex component, of course, and will contain a huge number of systems for control and landing, and of course, all of the plumbing for the Raptor engines will be squeezed in here as we saw months ago with the Mark I version of the Starship. So after the stacking of these two massive segments of the ship, there was some interesting footage here showing some frightening looking flexing of the rings as the two segments were mounted together. This I believe was just inner framing being mounted around to force the ring segments to align correctly. For a moment there we were a little concerned that the rings may not quite match up correctly, but we soon saw that the sections joined together perfectly well, so it's all looking fine now. Elon Musk did mention that a little persuasion is necessary with the SN1 prototype, but that the SN2 version will have a better fit and weld quality. Elon tweeted some beautiful footage from within the tent structure as well, showing the rocket nose cone production. This is coming together really beautifully. Elon also tweeted that only the liquid oxygen header tank is going to be placed in the nose cone. The liquid methane header tank will live within the main tank. This is good news as it keeps most of the space available in the top of the ship. Only around 2% of the main tank volume is in that header tank tank and the pressurized volume for cargo and crew remains at around 1,000 cubic meters. Construction also hasn't slowed with the facility itself. The new windbreak structure is now almost completed and we can now see the roof structure coming on now. Elon shared a little information saying that this is specifically for stacking the Starship engine bay, propellant tanks and nose sections together. It is a little hard to visualize just how this will look when components are scattered around the site. Other creators have shared the work of Raphael here during the week. Now, I recommend following him on Twitter because this latest version shows nicely how each component here is coming together. Elon just recently confirmed on Twitter that the liquid methane tank is definitely the top tank here. The liquid oxygen tank, which is the larger of the two, sits underneath. Interestingly as well, the header tank placed in the nose is only for liquid oxygen. The header tank for the liquid methane will actually still sit within the main tank itself here. There is going to need to be some plumbing magic here as the header tanks will need to be fed from the lowest oxygen tank. The lines are either going to need to be going around the methane tank or right through it. I'm interested in your thoughts on how you think that will work at this point. So yes, with all of these components assembled, we are really only left with the final segment of the pressurized area here. We can already see signs of this from brand new footage, so I suspect we're going to see the entire main stack here assembled very soon. The big news in my mind this week though is this tweet from Elon Musk just yesterday Today, saying that the Starship production and iterative improvement will be much faster than what we saw with the Falcon rocket. SpaceX will be driving hard for fully reusable orbital flight this year. Now wait, just let's comprehend this for a moment. By the end of this year. Now, it is impossible for Starship to get into orbit and return without the Super Heavy booster. That means that we could be seeing a Super Heavy booster constructed and flying within the next 10 months. That is a crazy thought and something I certainly wouldn't have believed possible. Again, it is incredible to see the speed of the development here. Two weeks ago, the suggestion of a full Super Heavy and Starship launch this year would have been laughable in my mind, but then look at the development speed from the last few weeks. 
could we see this SN1 version of the Starship flying that 20 kilometer test flight within a month or two? A few weeks ago, I would have said no, but the development over the last two weeks has certainly changed my mind. We are going to see this baby fly faster than you think. What are your thoughts on this though? When do you think that first test flight will take place? Let me know in the comments. Some awesome updates on the Crew Dragon vessel as well. SpaceX tweeted early in the week with an image of the vehicle destined to launch Crew to the International Space Station in a few months, saying that it has completed its acoustic testing in Florida. Another final test down before we get to see this baby mounted on top of that Falcon 9. This is going to be an amazing mission. The first time SpaceX will have ever launched a vehicle with crew on board and the first vessel in the United States to launch crew since the space shuttle retired in 2011. Almost a decade has passed since then, so this is going to be an incredible milestone and I'm curious to know how many more tests will be involved before the vehicle is completely ready to go. SpaceX also tweeted saying that the company Space Adventures now has an agreement with SpaceX to launch private citizens on the Crew Dragon spacecraft. This is the news that I've been waiting for. Tourist missions. Yes, these are going to be expensive, but as this industry becomes commonplace and with Starship in the future significantly reducing the cost to orbit, this will change everything. Eric Anderson, the founder of Space Adventures, actually replied to me here shortly afterwards on Twitter saying that this is a free flyer mission, no visit to the International Space Station. The mission will attempt to reach an altitude two or three times higher than the ISS, which would be between 800 and 1200 kilometers in altitude. That would be an amazing experience. In regards to the training that would be needed, Eric said that a few weeks should do it, which is significantly less than the few months required for previous missions. Previously, of course, Eric and Space Adventures organized Dennis Tito's flight to the space station on a Russian Soyuz rocket. That was the first ever tourist mission. More tourism missions have flown since then, of course, but this is still an untapped market, and the Crew Dragon, with its lower cost, may indicate a tipping point here. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Now, if you want a little bit more detail on Crew Dragon and its recent test, this video may interest you here. A lot of information in this one, especially about the in-flight abort test from January. And while you're here, of course, please do consider subscribing. There is loads of news coming up with Starlink and Starship and the upcoming Crew Dragon. I'd love to share all that with you. Last Saturday, a Cygnus resupply mission was launched to the International Space Station on the Antares rocket. On board was a compact electron microscope, a flame combustion experiment, and a bunch of research material for the crew. Now, I don't talk a lot about the Antares rocket, but this launch was a little more unique than usual. It's worth comparing a few stats to the Falcon 9, just so you can get an idea of the scale and the power of this rocket. Now, the first stage of the Antares is powered by two Russian-built RD-1 181 engines and they burn liquid oxygen and RP-1, which is the same as the Falcon 9. That is where the similarities between the vessels end though. The Antares is just over half of the mass of the Falcon 9 and has a maximum payload capability of around 8 metric tons to low Earth orbit when compared to the Falcon 9 in the expendable mode has a payload capacity of around 22 to 23 metric tons. That's really the only fair way to compare as well seeing as the Antares is expended every time. The second stage is quite unusual compared to most launch vehicles because it actually uses a solid rocket motor called the Castor uh, 30XL. In general, of course, you want a second stage to have a high efficiency with that high specific impulse. In this case, the decision to use a solid rocket motor was likely more because it's cheaper to manufacture. Now, I'm not personally fond of the simulated models here as opposed to live cameras from the stages that we see on the Falcon 9 launches, but what is nice to see is the orbital information as the mission progresses as we see here. It would be great if SpaceX could include this information as well. The Apogee tells us the current maximum height the vessel will reach with its current trajectory. The Perigee is the lowest point in the trajectory which is shown in negative numbers right up until the vessel is just about to hit orbital velocity. Now, this was interesting. As the Cygnus was about to be deployed, this phone call came in on the live stream. This was just bizarre. After that, everything went dead quiet for a while and we got to experience what you would normally find in Kerbal Space Program with the simulation here just glitching right out. Pretty unusual stuff. 
What was actually interesting was that this was the 13th resupply mission for Northrop Grumman, and it was the quickest back-to-back -back mission completed so far for Cygnus. The arrival of this vessel coming into dock at the International Space Station came only 18 days after the last Cygnus spacecraft left the station, so a very rapid turnaround there. Under the control of Drew Morgan on the International Space Station, the Canadarm2 captured the spacecraft as it passed over southeastern Russia. Beautiful footage of the capture there on NASA's live stream. On Monday, SpaceX launched the fifth Starlink mission, adding another 60 satellites to the existing constellation, bringing the total in low Earth orbit to around 300. This mission had some very unique features, and it was actually quite different to the previous Starlink missions. This booster broke the record for the fastest turnaround time of a reflight so far for SpaceX. Not only that, the booster had already flown three times previously. The first flight was the CRS-17 mission to the International Space Station in May of 2019, second was the CRS-18 mission in July of 2019, then finally the JCSAT-18 mission in mid-December. Only 65 days between that last launch and this mission. This was SpaceX's 80th successful launch in total, and it would have been the 50th successful landing had we not needed to say goodbye to that booster after it failed to land on the drone ship. Now this actually made a lot of news during the week because everybody now seems to find it unusual if SpaceX doesn't successfully land and a booster. How things have changed over the last five years. It's good to keep in mind that no other space launch provider reuses orbital class boosters at all, anywhere in the world. Now, there were a lot of theories floating around about why this failure occurred. I'm not going to guess too much on this, other to say that the fact that the booster landed so close to the drone ship, as we see by the smoke plume here, there wasn't anything drastically wrong. It didn't run out of fuel, otherwise it would have hit the water at a higher velocity. The control systems, such as the grid fin controls, must have been working quite well, seeing as it did land so close to the ship. If this had been a similar issue to the booster from CRS-16, it would have ended up much further off target. It was so close to the ship, it even managed to splash droplets on the camera here when it toppled over. So as far as the booster landings go, this to me looked like a late abort of the drone ship landing attempt due to a fairly minor issue. It may have been something as simple as coming in hotter than usual, perhaps not quite having the fuel margin to touch down safely. I don't know, but hopefully we'll get more news on that soon. Elon has been very quiet about this one, so it may not be an obvious issue. The drone ship, of course I still love you, has made it back safely already, but I'm still a little curious about what is happening with the booster itself. Sadly, that would have been the 50th successful booster landing. We'll just need to wait for the next mission to see that happen. It has been reported to have broken apart, but it was likely intact enough and still floating. I'm assuming at this point that the ship commander is either carrying some segments of the booster or it's been involved in some cleanup exercises. Perhaps the booster itself needed to be intentionally sunk to ensure it wasn't a hazard for other ships. Commander is due in port over the next day, so it's going to be interesting to see if it has returned with anything. If you see any news or shots about this, please let us know in the comments. The two fairing halves that cover the payload until the vessel leaves the bulk of the atmosphere behind were destined to be caught by the two fairing ships Go Miss Tree and Go Miss Chief, but sadly they both missed the catch. They've made their way back to port just recently, and as we can see here by these wonderful shots by Greg Scott, they've been able to retrieve the fairings from the ocean, but unfortunately both were broken. Normally these are very tough, so we're all waiting to to know what got these so busted up. Miss Tree looks to have been very close to the catch as we can see rope from the parafoils hanging from the net. I highly recommend following Greg on Twitter here as well. He manages to catch some of the most incredible shots. The satellites themselves sound like they're getting progressive upgrades to help reduce reflectivity as suggested by Elon Musk. This has been a concern for many around the world who would rather not see satellites blanketing the skies just after sunset or before sunrise when it's most noticeable. He did say here that the reflectivity should drop quite significantly on every successive launch, so this is great news. The most interesting part of this mission to me though was that SpaceX decided from this point on to put the second stage into an elliptical orbit at 210 kilometers by 390 kilometers in altitude. Now that is very different to the previous missions where the satellites were placed in a circularized orbit at around 290 kilometers in altitude. This time they were deployed much earlier, only around 15 minutes after launch, just as they passed below the tip of Greenland there. Now previously, launches have waited until the opposite side of the globe 
probe just under Tasmania in Australia here before deployment. Apparently the second stage didn't do a deorbit burn this time around but will instead allow the atmospheric drag at a lower altitude to eventually pull it back to re-enter in due course. Given the low altitude, this shouldn't take long to occur naturally, so it shouldn't be up there for too long, based on some rough calculations only around a month or two. Now, if you are a curious person and would love to understand these topics in more detail, I highly recommend checking out Brilliant. Do you want to understand the rocket equation? This classical mechanics course will kick off at the ground level with wonderfully detailed and interactive puzzles throughout. Start off understanding the basics of matter in motion, such as the universal dynamics of a single simple pendulum. Before you know it, you'll have progressed right up to the rocket equation and be understanding at a deeper level how thrust in one direction causes that equal and opposite reaction. Brilliant sets you up with this wonderful structured set of concepts with engaging puzzles and illustrations. This helps to build your understanding from that basic topic to a much more advanced progression of the subject. That is why this material is so unique. These topics are broken down to easily understand and then you can apply that understanding to more advanced related areas. Thank you very much to Brilliant for their support of this channel and if you would like to help support me and would like to give it a try, go to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off for the first year of Brilliant Premium. The link is in the description below. Thank you very much to my patrons here who are quite literally turning this dream of mine from a hobby into a real career. I've only had this going now for a little over a week, so if you would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. Those that would like to take it to that next level on here can interact with me more directly via the included exclusive roles in Discord. You can check out some exclusive patron-only content and simply know that you incredible members are changing my world here. Of course, a massive thank you to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about the amazing Solar Orbiter mission along with Starship, Crew Dragon and NASA News, so check that out. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.